Today is January 14, 1996, and I'm speaking with Lois Gumpert at her home in Bend, Oregon. We're talking about her experiences with the Chevlin Hickson Company of Bend, Oregon. This is tape number 15 of the Chevlin Hickson Oral History Project. My name is Ron Gregory, and the tape belongs to me. Okay. All right, Lois. Uh, when did you first meet your future husband? Well, when I was eight years old. Okay. So he must have lived nearby. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody lived nearby. <laughs> but not everybody's future husband. <laughs> well, what I mean, uh, it was concentrated in one area, you know. People weren't scattered all over the woods. They were all in one area. So, so everybody was close, more or less. So your your future husband, Ray Gumpert, was uh, more or less a neighbor, a childhood friend. Mm-hmm. And now did, uh, were they in the camp, living there in the camp before you, or did they come after you? Before. Okay. Uh, what was your wedding like? Well, um, we did get married in the church. We were married by uh, the Reverend Redden. Okay. You, got, you know him already. Um, let's see, what did they call him? Pastor of the Pines. He, he would be out at camp. Um, Oh, with the uh, Bible school, and he held the church services there. It was a non-denominational. I don't know what denomination he was, actually. I thought maybe he might have been a Baptist. I don't know. But anyway, he married us in Ben. And uh, Ray's brother was his best man. And... Uh, I had a friend that was stood in with me. So you were married here in Bend. Uh, did George Redden uh, was he minister or pastor mm -hmm. of the particular church here in town? Uh, no, he was the pastor of the Pines. He I, he didn't. Uh, I don't think had a church here. He he was uh, well. He just came to camp and, and held church services there. I, I suppose there's some special designation for his title that he would be uh, not a transient uh, minister like they did in the very early years, but uh, um, I, I couldn't tell you the background of him. Okay. Uh, so you got married in Bend. Was there a particular place here in Bend? Uh, at the parsonage where he that is in, in connection with his house. Oh, okay. So uh, it was out at the at the parsonage at the Redden's place. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, it, I don't know. He had a a study and so forth there. I don't know exactly how that was. I can't remember exactly. Okay. Uh, sounds like the the Gumperts had quite a few kids, quite a few members in their family, and, and then there were makers. It must have been quite a family turnout. Well, he had five brothers, or four besides himself. And they were all fairly close together in age. So uh, they, they had a good family, a good-sized family. And then they always had uh, all kinds of friends. Uh, Was being a minister or a pastor, was that all that George Redden did? Mm-hmm. Okay. That was his job. Okay. Uh, he, he conducted Bible schools and that sort of thing. I don't know if he did it other places or not, but he, he came there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were, let's uh, see, uh, the Lutherans used to come out, and I think they used the same building we did. And uh, um, 
Catholics had services occasionally, but they would be in homes. Okay. Well, uh, and Pastor Redden was able to make a living at doing this? I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is, all right, I did, that would be something I wouldn't have I, 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 don't, about. I don't know if you got to the part in the transcript yesterday, or I, I think it was Clint had said something that, that he had thought that George Redden also had a dairy farm between uh, Bend and Redmond on the old Redmond Highway. Oh, I don't think so. He lived um, on the river. Um, let's see, where can I tell you? Where would be, uh, you know, where the... the Lower Dam is where our irrigation water comes out. Well, it, there's a, a nice big area of the river there, a wide place, and there are houses along there, nice homes all along that area. In fact, it faces uh, the end of the seventh, I mean, uh, uh, River House Golf Course is across the river. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were your husband's parents' names? Walter and Josephine. Okay. Rachel Josephine, I think, was her uh, official name, but the, uh, she went by the name of Josephine. Can you tell they me? They called her Josie. Okay. Can you tell me something about them? Uh, what their occupations were, characteristics, or whatever? Well, uh, his mom was full-blooded Norwegian. And uh, his father, I think, must have been. Uh, let's see. Uh, I can't think of what the uh, what they called the uh, part of Germany. Um, oh shoot! What did they call that? Very common name. But anyway, his his father was a builder, I think. Or got that written down someplace. But anyway, I think he was from Wisconsin or somewhere in that area originally. And then he came to Stanwood, Washington, and that's where she was. Her parents, uh, she, well, in fact, she went to a Norwegian school there. It was an area around Stanwood, and they, there were mostly Scandinavian people, and they had a Scandinavian school. That's where she went to school. And, and so, uh, Mr. Gumbert, uh, Ray's dad, he worked in construction or? No, he worked in logging around that area, I think. He, he I think he ran some sort of a, uh, loader type machine. I've seen pictures of him. Well, how was it that they came to live in the logging camp and work for Shell and Hickson? Well, they migrated from, um, Stanwood, Washington, <clears throat> and I suppose they uh, got uh, transportation from Shanico, that's where everybody came, and, and then came by stage and wagons and whatever uh, to get as far, I think they came to Redmond, and then they established a homestead out here uh, on Friar Rear Road. And that's where my husband was born. Uh, so it sounds like that they came to this area with the intent uh, more to homestead in the beginning mm -hmm. than to... to yeah, oh, yes, that was their, okay. their idea. So, <coughs> the well... The country was being settled at right. that point, you know. And when was that, you recall? <coughs> it must have been in 1910. Okay because that's the year my husband was born, and uh, he was born, I think, a few months after they arrived here. He was born Christmas Eve. And of course, um, the, uh, well, it was a long ways out in the country, considered then. Redmond was the, was the biggest town. Sisters was fairly close, and that's where they, um, did their shopping, I think, mainly was, it was closer perhaps than Redmond, I don't, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, um, that's where they lived, and um, on Christmas Eve, they called the doctor, 
because Ray was being born, <laughs> and uh, they had to call the, the doctor from Redmond. And it happened to be Dr. Hosh, who was also he also was a doctor here at one point. But at that time, uh, during that time, he was uh, his practice was in Redmond. But uh, he didn't get there until after the baby was born. So his father delivered him, and then uh, I guess he came in and just looked around and said, well, it looks like everything's under control here. <laughs> he got back in his horse and buggy and left. He said, I'll send you a bill. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> so when Ray's brother was uh, born, my, they didn't even call a doctor. It, it, since he couldn't get there in time, they figured it was hopeless. And he was born in December also. So, you know, winters were bad in those days, it seemed like. So what did they do out on the homestead then after they moved here about 1910? Well, I think they raised some cattle. I know they had horses and some, sort of, some livestock and probably had fields where they raised grains of some sort. And then uh, he, uh, the dad went to work on the uh, uh, Tumalo project when they were building that dam. And then he uh, went to work, the Chevron started up. So Construction he, on the mill? Uh, well, I don't know what he did there actually, but he worked for the, the company. And um, he would walk to the to his job from out there, clear in the bend here. It must have taken him quite a while, I thought. Yeah. You know. So when was it that they decided to move into a, a, the logging camp? Well, it must have been uh, about three or four years later. And I get, uh, they moved from their homestead house into a, a bigger house. The, there was a, a neighbor that had left uh, because of his health, and he asked them if they would come and live in his place and take care of it. And then as time went on, they took care of it and they farmed it, and uh, then um, they decided they wanted to, to move to Chevlin because I think it was too much of a hassle for him to work there and then go home and work too. The children are all small, you know, probably just starting school. <clears throat> so they wrote to this man, they wrote numerous letters and never could get an answer. They never, never did know what happened to him. He never ever responded to him. He probably passed away because he left on account of his health. So there they were. So they locked everything up and moved, but as time went on, people came and, and took things, you know. Uh, they had a, he had a uh, um, blacksmith shop all fitted out there and, you know, farm machinery and so forth. Well, when they, they made the move into uh, the logging camp, now, it sounds like that was before 1920. Would that be about right? Or? I think it must have been, yeah, around 1919 19 or 20. I would guess. Okay. No, I don't know. Okay. I would think so. Okay. Did they, did they uh, hang on to the homestead or did they sell it, do you recall? No, I think they just let it go yeah. for taxes like oh. most people did. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, how many brothers and sisters were in your husband's family? Do you recall? He had names? four brothers. Four brothers. And what were their names? Floyd, Rollin, or Floyd, Clyde, Rollin, Ray, and Lord. In that order? Yeah, that way. Okay, so Ray was second to the youngest. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, what kind of work did your husband do for the company? Mm -hmm. Well, he did practically everything. <clears throat> you know, um, in those days, um, children were allowed to to work. You know, if they were 13 or 14, uh, they had jobs uh, piling brush. 
And they were all delighted to do that. And it was a good job, and they were paid well. And, but I don't think he started out doing that. I think when he first started to work, uh, he helped his um, his brothers. The older older ones were falling timber, possibly. And their dad was a saw filer. Then and uh, <coughs> so, you know, they were. It was jippo type of work, and it was okay. They could the kids would come out and help limb or whatever if they wanted to. You know, and their dad would get through with his job early in the afternoon, and sometimes he would go out and help them because they had to saw saw the tree up in certain lengths. You know, and of course all this was done uh, by a crosscut saw then. And so, uh, um, you know, it, it, may, it gave them something to do because there weren't chores for kids to do in there. What do you mean by jippo logging? They're paid by how much Whoa. work they do. Come in! They aren't paid by the month. They're paid by the unit or how much they do. They jippo. Hello, young fella. Hi there, Lee. I recognize you now. Talking about the jippo log, oh, you yeah. were explaining the to difference. me what that was. Well, like they they have scalers to go out and measure the logs, how many feet they are, and they're they're paid by the number of feet of timber, board feet that is. Right. So they're not they're not given or they're not paid an hourly wage. No. But rather. And the same thing with the track layers, they were paid by how much track they laid, and they have a whole crew working on that. So they, they they were paid, I assume, by a lump sum, which was divided up among the number of fellows that were working. Depending, it didn't make any difference whether they were pulling um, steel or laying steel. They all got the same salary. Okay. So it behooved them all to, to work. <laughs> if there was a lagger in the bunch, believe me, he was very unpopular. Yeah, it sounds like it might have been kind of advantageous for the company, uh, in a way. You know, if uh, to a, you know it, the old saying, well, it all pays the same. You know, I mean, if uh, you get out there and, and you put in your your ten hours of work, say at you know a uh, dollar an hour, well, you could have a three hour lunch. And you still get your money, but if you're working by uh, the foot, yeah. uh, then you know you really have to to produce to make good money. That's right. So the harder you work, the better you were paid. Well, that that applied to the timber flowers because there'd only be two yeah. on a job. So that was a good deal <clears throat> for the company. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, we kind of talked about this before, but I'd like to ask you again. Uh, did you and, and your husband have uh, many relatives who worked for the company and lived in the camps? Be, say between uh, uh, you and your family and he and his family? Well, uh, see, I just had the two brothers and my father, and they worked there. My, of course, my dad did originally, and then um, I think the boys, they probably told you this, when they worked there, they, they uh, let's see, well, Herbie went to college, and when he was home, he, he worked there. But there were uh, no cousins or uh, uncles? Oh, uh, no. Well, there were, uh, well, the five comfort boys and their dad all worked there. But they didn't have any cousins or, mm, or no. once in a while, some of the cousin would come, maybe for the summer and work. Mm -hmm. but, there used to be quite a few college kids that uh, would come up there and work during the summer because especially, I think, the football players or whoever, they like that type of physical sure. labor. It's hardened them for the football or whatever. Okay, now, now Ray... Uh, well, it doesn't work. It doesn't, huh? Something else wrong with huh. Okay. Um, how long did your husband work for Sheldon Hicks? Well, I think uh, all his life. He went to college, and then, um, then he came back and went to work. So, started 
you know, like I say, he wasn't on the payroll, but he'd go help his brothers. And the brothers, had, you know, oh. well, no, yeah, the mother, she took care of him. Well, okay, so you talked about him going to work it, you know, and uh, with his brothers and whatnot at an early age. Right? Well, yeah, before he was old enough to go to work, you know. Yeah. It was more or less the, well, they, they, they were close family of kids, you know, and they want to help each other. But it's it's not necessarily the case where uh, he didn't finish schooling and go to work. Oh, no. Okay. okay. Uh, it was depression about that time. Okay. When and he was in school. And his, uh, and his brother Clyde was going to Oregon State, too, at the same time. And they probably couldn't afford to keep both of them there. And I'm sure Ray was back of home because he was the homesick type. So in fact, he said one time he, of the when he was first down at Corvallis, a uh, uh, Ben High Band came down to play for the game or something, and that just set him off. He was <laughs> so homesick he wanted to go home with them, <laughs> even though his brother was there, but. Well, speaking of the band, did, did uh, the Shevlin Hickson band come out to camp and play? No. Okay. They uh, would play for the picnics okay. down at Ben Falls. Okay. My reason for asking, and you know, I'm looking through uh, Ledessa Walter's uh, album. There's a number of photographs there uh, of of the band in u uniforms and whatnot yeah. on flat benches out of the camp. Oh really? And, well, and I these were these were 1920, 1921 really? uh, photographs. Yeah. Well, I don't remember. That. Maybe it was. But it could be. I there's. A lot maybe of early on. Never yeah. thought much about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was before we were there. So, uh, so he worked with the company up till the time that the company basically shut down. Mm -hmm. And what did he do after that? Well, now, uh, you asked me, too, about what he did out at camp. Mm -hmm. Well, he worked um, on the steel gang, okay. for one thing. And he fell timber, timber. One of his brothers was his partner, and then, you know, they switched around. But then um, uh, he worked on the steel gang. That was a laying, pulling track. And... Um, what else did he do? Oh, well, then he went on the railroad. Okay. So he started out as a fireman, and then he was a brakeman, and then he ended up being a conductor. And it was at that point that they sold out. What does a conductor on a logging railroad train do? Well, he takes the train orders. See, they ran on the main line. And so, of course, the, the, uh, their trains had the uh, right-of-way. So they always would have to pull off at a siding, and there'd be telephone there, so they could tell where the oncoming train was. If you know it was coming from Clown Falls or wherever north, and so they'd have to uh, get the orders before they could get out on the main line. So they were responsible for the operation of the, of the train. So uh, when a uh a train is coming in with a log of loads, a load of logs, uh, and you have the, the locomotive, and then you have the tender. Uh, where is it? You know, I mean, obviously the engineer is in the locomotive. Where is the brakeman and the conductor? Well, they're probably in the caboose. Okay, there was a caboose there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, I would assume that's where, it, unless. Unless the brakeman was needed up uh, at the front end of the train or something. Depending on what they were doing, of course, when they were uh, coupling up to the flat cars or the loads of logs, they would have to have somebody right there. And during this whole time, uh, you know, up towards the end, did, did you and he and your family live out in the camp? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but then he they transferred to Bend. Because he had seniority, he could work wherever. Well, we were driving in to Bend when we were living out there by Shamal, 
It was a long distance. We were about even distance between Climate Fall, Eugene, and Bend. Mm -hmm. But the children had music lessons and dancing lessons, and we would be bringing them in the Bend, um, well, every week probably. Sometimes my dad would fly out to uh, Chamalt and pick them up and bring them in for their lessons, and they'd spend the weekend with my parents. But it was, you know, quite a, a chore to go back and forth every weekend. So um, he um, transferred to Bend then. And did, did you then move into this house? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we've lived here ever since. And uh, how long had had the camp been located at Shamal? Do you think when you did that? Oh, golly, probably several years. I don't know exactly two or three years. So, so you heard the news about uh, Brooks acquiring Shevlin while you were living here then. Uh, back to the other question, what did uh, Ray do after the company sold? Well, let's see, what did he do next? Oh, he went to work for Jill Wynn. I don't know if you don't know. No, tell me about that. Well, it's, uh, they have uh, businesses in, down in the southern states someplace, and their headquarters for this area is at Klamath Falls, but they uh, <coughs> make, oh, they made uh, baby crib stock and shoe heels and I, those are two things that I can think of that they they made, but they it was a remanufacturing plant. They manufacture, uh, well, like baby crib stock, you know, the railings and things for baby cribs, whatever made, is made out of wood. And what did Ray do for the company? Well, he was a foreman for a while there. And uh, either Lee or Herb gave me the impression that uh, after Shevlin closed, that they thought that Ray went down to Weed and worked for yes, McLeod. Yes, he did. Okay. He went down there and worked for, oh, I guess through one winter. But then when spring came, there, it, there was so much to do around here, and it was, you know, he had to be gone all week. And, well, in fact, he wouldn't always come home on weekends either, because that's a long trip to come home on, uh, at least on a Friday night. Uh, was going to McLeod, was that an option that other people who worked for Chevron had at the time that they sold out, or oh. was it just something that your husband looked into? That's something that... Uh, well, his engineer wanted him to go, too, and he was going down, and he was running a train. Okay, so so was the train then being transferred from no, Shevlin down? No, it was a separate. Nothing to do with Shevlin at all. It was just oh. a logging around Mount Shasta. <coughs> uh, so then Ray worked for the McLeod River Lumber Company. Yeah, he did. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the driving was rough, you know, between here and there. It's <laughs> yeah, and, but at that point it was bad. And you decided that you well, folks just didn't want to move down there for no, that job? No, no. Uh, but when spring came, and you know, he had to take care of this too, and it, it was just too much. So yeah, yeah. yeah I wasn't sure if if uh, you know. If you liked the area and you wanted to well, stay, well, you know, I never, I was, I've only driven through Shasta, the town, you know, going south to California, but I never did see where there, where he worked. But no, I suppose if we had been put loose and didn't have all this, we probably, if he liked to work there, we could have moved there. But um, so when he came back, then what did he do? Well, I think that's when he went for, uh, to work for Jell Wynn. Uh, I remember that's how it went. But he didn't have to work in Klamath Falls for that? Oh, no. Or that was here in Bend? Yeah, the plant was right here. Oh, okay. And, in fact, it still is running. It's um, out there by uh, Primark. 
right on the railroad track. They built a new uh, plant since then. Uh, did you ever know the Cecil Cox family? Oh, sure. What, what did Cecil do for the company? Well, he was uh, an engineer. Um, Ray worked on his train some of the time. They moved him around, but Cecil was uh, the engineer for the two spot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not that that matters, but. Seems like I remotely, remotely remember a story about uh, Cecil catching a runaway car. What can you tell me about that? Well, you probably have a good description of it from the boys. I imagine, it's, uh, didn't Junior tell you about that? That's never been mentioned. Well, they were talking about it yesterday. I thought they told it. I heard a lot. I, I heard various things on Cecil Cox this and Cecil Cox or well, Zubik that or, or Hoagie Bill this. But uh, huh. do you recall what that was about well, Cecil Cox? Well, the train, uh, a, a, a car got loose from the train some way, I suppose, it, in shifting them around. I don't know just how it happened, but the school also at the end of the track it was on a downhill slant, so uh, the car was headed for the school, a loose flat car, and Cecil took off and just blasted the train down there and looked onto it. It was just fortunate that it hooked, you know. It, um, those things usually, you know, they, they're supposed to, but they don't always. Yeah. Couplings. Couplings, yeah. And uh, school was in session. Uh -huh. yeah. So it was a close call, I guess. You say of course, they, we didn't know anything about it in the school because <laughs> it was outside. Yeah, so it sounds like he must have been quite a hero. <laughs> yeah. you know, saved everybody's kids. <laughs> He was. When about was that? Do you recall approximately? Mm, no, I don't. It must have been in the 20s. You were in school then? Early 20s, yeah. Okay. Uh, one other thing I'd like to ask you, Lois, and uh, you know, I, I ask a, a couple of people, uh, but I didn't ask you the last time I was I spoke with you, and that is. Uh, you know, if if a woman's husband was killed on the job, uh, what became of his widow and children? Well, I think. Well, I, they wouldn't stay there. That's for sure. There would be nothing there for them, because there weren't any jobs for women except the two waitresses or three or whatever they had. Those were the. Perhaps the only in the early days. Later on, we got a nurse, but um, they they wouldn't have any reason to be there. They would go someplace. Do you ever remember situations like that occurring? Uh, well, uh, I remember one family that uh, the husband got killed. And they settled in Bend. Okay. I remember well, in that article yesterday that Clint brought in. Yeah. Uh, a couple of the men, well, four men got killed, but two of them had been longtime employees and had families. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Bagan was one. Uh, mm -hmm. And who was the other? Joyce. Joyce. Well, Joyce is the one I'm thinking of whose wife must have moved to Bend because I lived here. In fact, she remarried. What, did the company have any kind of insurance policies in cases like that? Or? Uh, not to my knowledge, but they could have. You didn't ever know of, of your dad or Ray or anyone having a Shevlin Hickson insurance policy? No. They had their own individual insurance policies, you know, I mean, like you probably have, and we, you know, in the event that happened, you know, in this particular case, do you ever remember uh, neighbors or community people, you know, passing a hat or making any kind of, uh, you know, helpful efforts to get this woman and her family kind of off? Well, I don't know. I don't know. 
Well, the people out there were very benevolent. They helped their neighbors. If anybody was sick, they'd all do everything they could for them, even taking up the collection to pay their hospital bills if necessary. Of course, uh, the fellows at camp had access to the Lumberman's Hospital. They were, they were, that was there, they could go there, anything happened to them. Idea. Well, that ends the questions I had to ask. Is there any other recollection that you have that, that, that I've forgotten, which is probably many that you might like to share at this time? <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you something with me was here, and I forgot what that was. Something that was kind of funny. <laughs> I did tell you, though, didn't I, about, yeah, I did, about Ray and the doctor. I mean, the doctor not getting there. Well, you know, the payout for that was uh, my daughter was being married in Norway, and uh, we were planning to go to the wedding. <clears throat> so I applied. I already had my passport because I'd been in Europe before, but he hadn't. And so I made the application, and we had to go through Seattle, the, I don't know, the Bureau of Statistics or whatever it is. and. <clears throat> And they uh, stalled around with it. We'd already bought our tickets and everything, and usually it only takes a couple of weeks to get your passport. But eventually it came and uh, it said, Baby Girl Gumpert on the birth certificate. So that Dr. Hosh that came out there and said everything looks fine here and left, when he got back to Redmond, <laughs> Apparently he couldn't remember if it was a girl or a boy, and he wrote down a girl, and he gave gave her a name, Roberta. <laughs> well, that was a horrible shock, and there we were, with our practically our foot out the door to go, and so it uh, he ha had to go through a lot of rigmarole to get that proved that Not he bad. was who he was. Fortunately, he had a brother still living. And, of course, he swore to it that that's him. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, the plane left, of course. So we didn't make it to the wedding, just on that account. Mm -hmm. Well, did did uh, all of Ray's brothers wind up working in the camp? Did mm -hmm. they stay and work in the camp? Yeah, they did. Uh, let's see, one of them went to Primeville, and he had a... Uh, well, he, he became an electrician, and uh, he had a, uh, a kind of a sporting goods shop where he sold bulls and arrows and that mm -hmm. type of thing, hunting equipment. And, let's see, one of them had gone to college for quite a while. He was a real good at art. That was one of his subjects, I mean, one of his majors, I think. He did a lot in that, but uh, and he ended up uh, owning a ranch up in the Polina area. Then he uh, then he moved to Primeville and, and had a ranch there too. And let's see, the other one, well, when when Chevron closed down, I think he moved to Primeville too. Most of them moved to over there. Well, it sounds like then that that of the five boys, three of them continued working in the woods uh, after they had reached manhood, basically. Well, well all of them really did. Mm -hmm. okay. they, they continued working there until, oh, after a few years, you know, one of them went to Prineville, and, well, several of them did, but then... But before the, before the shutdown? Yeah, okay. two of them, I think, did. Then the other two went over there after the shutdown, and they all got jobs over there. I'm thinking that's correct. <laughs> I'm just stop and sort it all out. Yeah. I'm talking to Ladessa, you know, she she'd say the same thing. I'd ask her a question, and you know, it might go back to the twenties or whatever. And she'd sit there for a minute. And she'd look at me, and she'd say, "Well, that was seventy years ago." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, I think, must have had a very interesting life because she lived out there at the town of Fremont, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right out of Fort Rock. And, 
Yeah. We talked briefly about that. Uh, Did she tell you about losing your little boy? No. Come in. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Oh, good.